Hello, my name is Benjamin Dooley for the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. I'm a journalist in residence here. Uh, we are joined today by Dr. Mwang Zarni. He's a longtime Burmese activist and genocide scholar. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Documentation Center in Cambodia. He's here with us to discuss uh, recent events that have happened in Rakhine province, where in the past few weeks, close to uh, half a million refugees have fled into neighboring Bangladesh in what is being called one of the worst current refugee crises in the world. Uh, Dr. Zarni, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, now, you were recently in Kuala Lumpur uh, with the People's Tribunal for Myanmar. Uh, just off the bat, I want to ask you a little bit about the work that you're doing there and how it's been collecting evidence, uh, publishing your findings, etc. Well, I mean, Permanent People's uh, Tribunal, PPT, uh, came out of the uh, Vietnam, uh, you know, anti-Vietnam War movement in the 60s. And the permanent headquarters uh, is based in uh, Rome. And so this, uh, the, the final session that we had in um, uh, Kuala Lumpur uh, the, was the follow-up for the, um, the one that uh, we had at um, Queen Mary University Law School um, last, um, you know, uh, earlier uh, this year in March. And that the work that um, uh, the tribunal has done uh, it's really, um, you know, outside the uh, global governing st structures, uh, particularly the UN justice system, because uh, ICC, Security Council, Con uh, Security Council, and uh, powerful member states, states have, in fact, um, uh, failed to take up the, uh, you know, the the the, the genocide um, issue uh, that has been, um, you know, uh, uh, in place uh, over the last. Um, almost 40 years uh, and so what we saw last um, you know last month half a million um, exodus of refugees from Burma uh, is is only uh, the fourth or fifth wave wave of refugees and you know it, all of that started in 1978 as a result of uh, the the Burmese military directed uh, centrally organized uh, uh, attacks on uh, Rohingyas uh, with the purpose of essentially exterminating them and so the, the tribunal, um, you, you know, uh, rightly focused on uh, the um, multidisciplinary approach, you know, uh, the, honoring the, um, the original framer of the, um, uh, the term uh, genocide, um, Raphael Lumpkin. So, so the tribunal approached the evidence gathering, uh, the honoring the victims, because uh, this process puts the victims in the driver's seats rather than powerful entities deciding what victims' experiences are or, or naming the crime that they experience. And so in that sense, uh, tribunal is intellectually and uh, philosophically and morally extremely important. And so what we discover from three different victim communities, uh, the Kachins in the civil war zones of northern Burma, uh, the Rohingya Muslims in western Burma, and the uh, Burmese Muslim uh, um, as a whole um, is that the state of um, Burma, the military and now hybrid government of Aung San Suu Kyi uh, are guilty of um, essentially um, uh, you know, either fully fledged genocide or have the uh, intent to uh, pursue genocidal policy down the road. Now, I want to ask you about that specifically because uh, it has been called uh, in recent weeks a textbook case of ethnic cleansing by uh, people at the United Nations General Assembly, the UNHCR. Uh, this terminology though doesn't quite cut it for you. You've called it a genocide with ethnic cleansing elements. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more on that distinction as you see it and why in your view uh, this applies to the situation as it stands. Well, I mean, I understand that ethnic cleansing has has been uh, put in a wide circulation uh, since 1995 at Srebrenica, um, I, and 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 with uh, some of the most uh, you know respected genocide scholars such as uh, Daniel Feierstein and uh, you know Gregory Stanton, who developed this uh, ten-stage model of genocide. Uh, you know, we all reject um, you know very strongly 
uh, the United Nations adopting the language of a former perpetrator. Uh, no one other than Milosevic used the term uh, ethnic cleansing because he was a, a clever uh, killer. So he knew that there was no international law uh, that could be triggered to punish an, um, a, a state's behavior that is described as ethnic cleansing. And so it is actually a euphemism for what essentially is a, a, a genocide. And a genocide is a process, as any uh, genocide scholars and lawyers know. And so I think that is why I think like when UN Secretary General uh, you know, answer the Al Jazeera reporter's questions. Do you, can you think of a better word to describe when one third of the population has been driven out? Uh, and, and, and if I were that to reporter, I would have uh, responded by saying, Mr. Secretary General, genocide. This is an ethnic cleansing. There is no such thing as textbook example of genocide. There is only you know, textbook example, sorry, no such thing as textbook example of ethnic cleansing. There's that, only textbook example of a genocide. And, and textbook, the finally textbook, I mean, ethnic cleansing only describes the events that unfold, that are captured on camera and that news media are report to the world. And genocide is a, a long drawn out process starting with dehumanization. I think like the, the you know, to describe uh, the genocide that Rohingya people experience uh, as simply events of ethnic cleansing. It's really an insult to the injury. So in your view, it, it, just to clarify, what is going on is um, systematic genocide that's been going on over a long period of several decades. Uh, the Burmese uh, military is claiming that they are fighting uh, militants in the area. Um, but it, in your view, the, the main goal of, of what has been going on, particularly over the past few weeks, is to completely do away with the Rohingya population. Uh, do, do I have that correct? Absolutely. You know, like uh, personally, my own late great uh, uncle was the deputy commander in charge of the entire Rohingya district back in 1960s when the Burmese military and the Burmese government decided that uh, Rohingyas would be embraced as a Burmese, a part of the, the Union of Burma, as an ethnic group and an equal and full political citizens of the Union. This was in 1960s. And my own relative was involved in uh, accepting and embracing this community. Yeah, There are other ethnic communities as well. And so when General Nguyen took over power in a military coup in 1962. Uh, the, the Nguyen was, um, you know, half Chinese, half Burmese, and uh, he had this like Islamophobic, um, you know, turn in, uh, within the army, and that the Islamophobia became institutionalized within a few, the, the first few years of um, his military coup in 1960s. We had a similar, uh, you know, exodus forced migration of massive Indian community of different um, uh, faith, uh, faith backgrounds, like, you know, what we saw in Uganda in the 1970s under Idi Amin. And then so I think, you know, to, to say that the Burmese military is responding now to what they describe as a Bengali extremist terrorist, uh, the, a small group of um, you know, angry, frustrated Rohingya man, you know, uh, essentially rise, uh, revolting because they, they knew their communities are sitting ducks because they were born into this genocidal situation where conditions were designed by the Burmese government to essentially make life impossible. And so I think today's, uh, you know, Rohingya uh, militants, uh, were not even born when the Burmese military started institutionalizing this extermination policy in the 1960s. Uh, the de facto leader of Burma, Aung San Suu Kyi, a well-known democracy advocate, Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, has drawn a lot of uh, ire over the past year, but particularly over the past uh, few weeks over her actions, or should say lack thereof when it comes to the Rohingya issue. Um, in your opinion, 
what is her calculation now? What, what is she thinking? Is she uh, having to tread a sort of delicate line between the interests of her former jailers, the Burmese military, or is there per, perhaps some other motive or agenda behind uh, how she's handled the situation? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I, I had um, the, the firsthand uh, interaction with her uh, on this specific issue of Rohingya, uh, um, of, of violence against Rohingyas. Uh, back in uh, June uh, 2012, she, you know, for, when she first returned to England, after about 25 years, we share a panel at the London School of Economics. And, and because she was unprepared to handle this sensitive issue, uh, a few days before the, uh, the televised uh, panel with her, I was pre-assigned to handle the, um, you know, the, the, the question that might arise from the floor that, that had to do with Rohingya. And so, you know, I, I have handled it. Uh, it's, it's on YouTube as well. And, and uh, you know, essentially, uh, the, the position that she has taken, in my view, is unconscionable for two reasons. One is, uh, despite the fact that she is, uh, you know, she does not see eye to eye with the Burmese generals, over the pace of the reforms, the scope, and where the priorities are, uh, what the priorities would be in terms of reform. On the Rohingya persecution, she is on the same page with her. And also, like, you know, <clears throat> people say that, she, you know, her, she has no control over the, um, the, uh, the security forces. Uh, you know, the, she has no, she has, she is in no position to tell the uh, commander in chief, the most powerful general, what to do, what not to do with the Rohingya, or to, you know, uh, beyond like uh, uh, telling the, uh, the army to abide by the code of uh, um, uh, conduct uh, in counter, counter insurgency situations. Well, I think that, that you know, there's a, a major problem here when we frame Aung San Suu Kyi as powerless, particularly because she, you know, A, she is on the same page with uh, the generals and she views the uh, Rohingyas as not belonging to Burma. That's where what, the problem uh, begins. Yeah. What, uh, uh, just to follow up to that, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the encounter that you had with her at the London School of Economics uh, at, a, at a forum you helped host and how um, you would be the one to handle uh, to fray questions about the Rohingya, and she wasn't prepared to address it. Um, what would you say to some people that say, well, she had an election to run in in a few years, and this is uh, uh, a sensitive topic with the Burmese military, and she'd only been out of house arrest uh, for some time. Uh, what, makes, what makes you very confident that she is indeed on the same page as these Burmese generals and not trying to walk a delicate line for the sake of a, uh, a democratization of Myanmar? Well, you know, I think when it comes to Burmese, uh, you know, the majority Buddhist Burmese and uh, non-Burmese uh, minority issues, you know, there's a, a center periphery uh, relations. Yeah, we, the Buddhist majority at the center of the uh, uh, the, the state uh, controlling all different types of um, state uh, 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 institutions and the uh, ethnic and religious minorities scatter um, along strategic borderlands. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> as early as 1970s, long before, you know, she touched the Burmese politics with uh, a, a long pole. She was uh, studying or like uh, she was just a fresh um, a graduate out of Oxford, and uh, there, there was there there was there was a Foreign Office uh, official internal document where she was you know uh, by by a very well known uh, um, you know uh, Foreign Office uh, um, you know official uh, the Se uh, Secretary of State for India uh, the uh, you know uh, Lord Goldbooth who was like her father figure who helped her come to UK. Gorbud wrote that Aung San Suu Kyi was anti-Shan. Yeah, Shan is a minority group. And then, like, <clears throat> uh, the fast forward right after she, um, you know, she won the elections, and she had a, 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 a private meeting 
with a group of uh, peacemakers. Uh, three of the top peace negotiators in Burma, they were my, my, they were my close friends uh, in exile. And they had a meeting with her uh, uh, privately, like, only like six or seven in the room. And they, you know, one of them recounted to me um, Aung San Suu Kyi's view toward the minority. This is not towards Rohingya per se, but all minorities. And, she, and he said her view and the Burmese general views towards uh, non-Burmese minorities are exactly the same thing. That is to say that they both, uh, you know, uh, have this internally colonialistic you know, big brother mentality, yeah? And, and so I think, the, and, and there are so many examples, concrete examples of how she is, let me say this uh, categorically, as racist uh, towards non-Buddhists, particularly Muslims, uh, and, and uh, you know, have this uh, colonial mentality towards uh, non-dominant ethnic groups. And this isn't simply about election calculations, yeah? And uh, before she won the crushing election in uh, 2015, people gave her, uh, you know, a huge benefit of the doubts, as you suggested. Well, maybe she was, you know, she wanted to get the uh, majority votes from the Buddhists, so therefore she could not be seen as too sympathetic to the oppressed Muslims. Well. Now is two years after she's in power, yeah? I mean, not in full power, but she's got enormous leverage with the international community. You know, she is, she is still like, you know, seen by the Burmese majority public as, you know, um, the leader who can do no wrong. I mean, you know, like when she gave that, um, you know, um, important speech, um, in, uh, you know, two weeks, uh, uh, actually last week, uh, televised, uh, aimed at diplomats and UN officials, um, you know, the whole country took to the streets, uh, you know, holding the signs that, you know, uh, we stand with Don San Suu Kyi. So I think this isn't simply the, you know, the Aung San Suu Kyi's position is not simply the result of pe political calculation. It is actually quite disturbingly uh, driven by her racial and ethnic prejudices. I mean, it is so sad to say this is the woman that inspired me to, to, to take up the uh, course of human rights and I supported her for 15 years. I will be the last to want to say that we've got a, a serious problem where, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize winning, uh, you know, popular leader is turning out to be racist and colonial toward non-Burmese Buddhist minority. I am Buddhist, I am from the majority. And if, if someone like myself could come out and say racism is wrong, you know, I lived outside the country for like, you know, 25 plus years, and then so has she. And, and you know, with someone um, with her level of education at Oxford, like, you know, international experience, she should be staring down this type of racism and, and, and and, and, and basically telling the, the, the Burmese public, we are heading toward human rights. We want the human rights for everybody. Uh, this racism is anti-Buddhist and anti-human rights. And no, she is pandering to the majority uh, uh, public racist opinion, and she is defending the military. She is denying um, you know, credible allegations of crimes against humanity and genocide. If, if that is indeed the case, what do you think would be the proper course of action? Should, uh, w would you call on her to leave her post? Uh, and, and if so, what do you think would happen to the uh, democratization process in Myanmar? Well, I think that the, the right uh, course of action is being taken. And, 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 and you know, I'm critical of uh, uh, the established human rights organizations because they, they tend to make uh, their reports, you know, whether it's acceptable or for member states. But in this specific case, I must, I must give like a Human Rights Watch, uh, you know, the credit where it is due. Because uh, Human Rights Watch just yesterday came out uh, with a very... Um, you know, a damning statement saying Myanmar, Myanmar uh, security troops are 
committing that, you know, uh, crimes against humanity and that, you know, that the ICC needs to take up this issue. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, if that's, if that is, the, you know, the only resort left uh, to, to put, uh, you know, a substantive pressure on the Burmese military and Aung San Suu Kyi's government to uh, end the persecution of Rohingya, then I think that, the, you know, it opens up the question of Aung San Suu Kyi's role. You know, like a Sir Jeffrey Nice, you know, the uh, deputy uh, prosecutor in the Milosevic case, um, had uh, penned a piece for foreign policy just like uh, uh, um, uh, last year, uh, raising the issue of Aung San Suu Kyi's um, culpability. She, you know, as de facto head of state, uh, that she is expected to understand and to know what, you know, constitutes an internationally uh, uh, persecutable crime. And, and she is actually, in, in the words of Sir, Sir Jeffrey Nice, potentially uh, criminally responsible. So that goes beyond Suu Kyi resigning it. I don't think she will resign it. And, and, and finally, on this issue, like, you know, the, the wall seems to be like a, a very much a disappointed by the way she has handled, the way she has defended the army, dismissed any, um, you know, allegations of, um, you know, international crimes that uh, the uh, uh, Myanmar state is committing against Rohingya. Well, I think the psychological issue uh, here that has not been talked about is, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, you know, uh, um, you know consider her father the most important figure in her life. When he was assassinated, she was only two. And in her view, he was a great general. And she fancied herself when she was a little girl, by her own admission, uh, as a soldier. And so now she is essentially closing ranks with the, the Burmese army her father founded because she considered Burmese generals her father's sur surrogate uh, uh, sons. And so she has repeatedly and publicly expressed her genuine love for the army. Well, when you have an army or the armed forces credibly accused of committing mass gang rapes, uh, forced expulsion, arson, and destruction, and, and, and uh, even genocide and crimes against humanity, you cannot keep you know, expressing your love and treating the generals as your, you know, surrogate siblings. But that's exactly what she is doing. And she, I think she is feeling that she is defending the nation, uh, you know, holding the hands of her father's surrogate sons. And so we have a serious, serious problem. I, the, trust me, she will not change her course. And so only the international community will have to find concrete way to intervene uh, you know, I don't mean just mi militarily, but to, to put an end to this uh, major human tragedy. I mean, like we have said uh, never yes. again since, uh, you know, 1945. And we are making never again, uh, 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 making a mockery out of this slogan. I want to touch upon that. Uh, here in Canada, um, there has been uh, a lot of condemnation of what has been going on uh, in in Myanmar, uh, uh, as well as uh, around the world. Um, there have been many voices, for example, calling for Aung San Suu Kyi's honorary Canadian citizenship to be revoked. Uh, Canada does have a long tradition of uh, funding international organizations that help out refugees, for instance. Um, is there anything more that Canada, Canada can and should be doing at this moment uh, to help alleviate the situation? Yes, there, there's, there's so, actually, there are a lot of things Canada can do, you know, um, you know, Canada was instrumental in um, essentially ushering in the new concept or principle, if non-binding, the responsibility to protect. We have a, we have a textbook case of, you know, um, a, a, a member state, not only failing to protect the citizen, but, you know, playing the role of the main perpetrator, uh, you know. So I, I think stripping Aung San Suu Kyi of honorary citizenship is uh, symbolic. It may hurt her image, but that is immaterial. What is important is to realize that, uh, you know, uh, 
in a genocidal country, democratization and civil society development is not possible. You know what I mean? In, in the middle of uh, 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 the Nazi Holocaust, no Western governments, however liberal and uh, generous and uh, tolerant, would say, well, let's just, uh, you know, uh, try to salvage the uh, German democratic system under Hitler, and it's only a genocide, and let's just, you know, look the other way, and then let's just keep building democracy. No. So I think what I would suggest is, uh, you know, the Canada suspend any type of bilateral cooperation, bilateral assistance, uh, technical, um, the, the funding to... Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the democracy projects, because civil society is fully behind this project. If you go to Burma or if you read any uh, research reports on the, where the public is in terms of Bur um, Myanmar's state's persecution of Rohingya, you will find a near total agreement in favor of driving the Rohingyas out. And so in that sense, I mean, you know, given that, I think Canada can can do like uh, you know a, a, a number of things uh, you know starting with like you know uh, the putting a mor moratorium on funding uh, for democracy project um, the downgrading the uh, diplomatic relations the United States had done it um, you know when Aung San Suu Kyi was under house arrest sent the Burmese ambassador home packing and they only kept the uh, you know charge a level and uh, we call the ambassador from from Rangoon. And then so these are things that need to be rep, uh, replicated. And then finally, I think Canadian government should issue um, essentially um, an, um, a directive or advisory to Canadian companies. This is a country that is committing a genocide or at the very least uh, crimes against humanity. We Canadian companies and uh, organizations do not want to hold hands with uh, the community, national community, the government, or the political party that are seen or that are effectively party to the genocide. Dr. Zarni, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.